Fine furniture, musical instruments, functional art, beautiful decoration. These pieces and others like them are crafted in wood by master woodworkers who live here in Santa Cruz County and on the Central Coast. In this series we meet some of these craftsmen and explore the paths they took to develop their talents. We will look at examples of their work. We will discover what and who inspired them. Please join us as we enter their workshops and watch them demonstrate the skills and the techniques they use in creating their signature pieces. Hello and welcome to our third program in the series Woodworks. My name is John Hall and today I'm delighted to be visiting the house and studio of Ron Cook here on the west side of Santa Cruz. Morning Ron. Good morning. Thank you for inviting us along today. You're welcome. We would like to start, Ron, by having you describe to us the, the type of woodworking that you do. We'll be seeing examples of it in a, in a few minutes, but how would you describe to somebody generally the sort of work that, uh, that you do? Uh, I'm often called a luthier, which is a stringed instrument builder, and I build stringed instruments of uh, various kinds, mountain dulcimers, uh, mountain banjos, uh, and medieval instruments. Now I know you're being modest. <laughs> there are other things that you, uh, that you make as well. Well, I'm also working on recently uh, medieval furniture. Uh, I do carvings of uh, spoons, uh, functional and decorative. Mm -hmm. With wood that I can't use for anything else, I'll, I'll make carpet birdhouse. <laughs> so that's a pretty wide diversity. It's, it's fun. It's, I love to carve. So let's take a look at your background, Ron, um, and can you uh, describe to us how you got into woodworking in the, in the first place? Uh, a lot of it uh, goes back to my, my father, who was a carpenter. Uh, when I was young, uh, I spent a lot of time in, in his workshop, and uh, he built pieces for the house. Uh, he built his own boat, and, and I got to watch and learn from him in that respect. Later on, my father uh, built a house for the family, and it was just the two of us, really, that, uh, that put it all together. And he, t he taught me carpentry in that respect. Mm -hmm. From there, uh, I started getting interested in music, uh, guitar, mountain dulcimer, and at one point I finally could not, uh, I couldn't afford a mountain dulcimer and I decided to build one. And at that point, uh, it, I've never looked back. I started working on the mountain dulcimers and shortly uh, after seeing some of the carved heads on antique instruments, uh, the Baroque and Renaissance style uh, violas uh, had beautiful carved heads on them. And I thought that would be a wonderful thing to try to uh, put on a mountain dulcimer. Mm -hmm. And uh, with all the different instruments that I'm making now, uh, I'm learning the instruments really as I go along. Uh, I can uh, play harp a little bit, uh, a lot of the different uh, stringed instruments that, uh, that I make. Uh, I research them and then learn how to play them to demonstrate them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's take a look inside the house and uh, at some of these uh, stringed instruments that you make. All right. Mountain dulcimer is what I originally started with in 1972. And the uh, very first one I made is this one right here. And this is before I knew <laughs> much about woodworking. There's no bending. I didn't know how to steam bend wood. Um, the wood I just purchased basically veneer from a lumber yard. And, uh, salvaged uh, gears from a broken guitar, but it uh, still has a nice nice tone. And uh, then I became a carpenter, was able to start uh, equipping a shop, and studying the uh, 
instruments and the uh, medieval instruments and early uh, Renaissance and Baroque instruments that uh, had carved heads. And these, uh, and this is what came out of it. I thought that I'll, I'll make a, my next dulcimer with a carved head. And this is my second dulcimer. And this is when I started learning how to bend wood and started carving. So how long after the first one did you make this one? This is three years. Three years? Yeah, this is from 1975. And you learned to carve within that period of time? I did. And the, and the first carvings were all by hand. There uh, no uh, no power uh, mm -hmm. power carving tools or anything. It was all uh, small chisels and, and a lot of sandpaper. I'm self-taught in, in all of the uh, uh, the luthier techniques mm -hmm. that uh, that I use, and all the uh, and of course the carving. Uh, now I'm, I'm using more uh, power uh, rotary uh, carving tools for uh, for these. I can I can get a lot more detail with uh, what the bits are almost like little tiny dental bits, so I can really get uh, fine detail. Mm -hmm. I got interested into the uh, history of the Mount Dulcimer and where they came from. And I started looking at, at a lot of my, uh, I've got a large library in, in the house here. Um, started looking at the, uh, uh, the German and the French and the, the Norwegian, Scandinavian influences for the Mount Dulcimer. And uh, this is actually the, where it started, is with this instrument here. This is a, a, a German Scheitholt, and it's um, this particular one uh, is based on a uh, one from about 1500 to 1600. Mm -hmm. So you can see it's a very long instrument with three strings, and it's still played exactly like the Mountain Dulcimer nowadays. It's got the same tuning, the same fret spacing. This, this is a Pennsylvania German Dulcimer. You can see it's got uh, nine strings on it, but I have it still tuned to like a mountain dulcimer, mm -hmm. and it's played the same way. And so it's originally a German design with Pennsylvanian influences. With Pennsylvania influence, and uh, between the Pennsylvania, uh, the French, Epinette de Vosges, which is from the 1700s. This is the Vosges mountain region is right across the border from Germany, so that you can see there's an influence in the, the style. But all these, and then the, uh, uh, the Dutch had an instrument that had a, a bout on it. So they started all combining with the different cultures that were coming into the country and uh, developed into the teardrop shape and the hourglass shape. Those are the two most common shapes now. This is strictly an American instrument, uh, American development mm -hmm. uh, from these influences. What sort of wood would they have used in originally in the Middle Ages? So we, we're talking about something that would have been made, what, 600 years ago? They're always made from materials indigenous to the region. They, a lot of them were made from the pines of, of that region. Mm -hmm. So there's some more soft woods on, on them. And of course in the Appalachian areas there's hickory and, and uh, there's dulcimers made out of cherry wood and, and of course walnut. And I imagine that each wood produces a different a different tone? Yes it does, mm -hmm. yes. Um, any instrument with a soft wood top like the redwood would have a little bit louder tone than the hardwood tops like the you know, complete uh, black walnut one. Was this your uh, your latest piece you were talking about my, earlier? My latest is uh, made this auto harp <laughs> based on an 1895 uh, Zuckerman Model 73 auto harp. It was the first one that had all you know, 12 keys. Most of them had three to five at that period, and uh, I created this one based on. This one down here, which is, uh, I found on uh, <laughs> on an auction site, I was able to get it for eight dollars, <laughs> and it's in pretty good condition. Uh, I'll restore it a little bit uh, eventually. These are called rotes, R-O-T-E-S. Um, 
they're a handheld liar that dates back to the 600s. Mm. And the, uh, these are based on instruments that have been found in burial mounds in uh, the Black Forest in Germany for this style. This is a, what I call a Germanic rote. And this style is the Saxon rote. And examples of these have been found in burial mounds in uh, East Anglia, uh, the uh, eastern coast of uh, England. And uh, uh, the most, of course, the most uh, uh, famous one is the Sutton Hoo excavation that uh, there was an entire uh, ship buried as a, as a burial chamber and inside one of them, uh, besides a lot of uh, gold and, and uh, riches, there was uh, an instrument and it was part of one of these. It, it, a lot of it had deteriorated, but um, the top with the precious metal stones and, and uh, metal pieces up here and, and the top part of it survived and the uh, the pieces are at the British Museum and the uh, they're in the Sutton Hoo room and there's uh, a reproduction sitting right next to it that was uh, produced by Bernard Ellis which was uh, the late Bernard Ellis who was a, a, also a, a, an instrument builder similar doing similar pieces that I'm doing and uh, I based my first one on the Sutton Hoo and in the previous ones, these are the newer ones. Uh, these are actually based on one that was uh, discovered in 2001 in Prittlewell. And it was a, uh, a burial mound that turned out to be what they call the, the Prittlewell Prince because it was one of the most, uh, one of the richest finds and undisturbed finds that they've, that they've come across. And there was a piece in there. Uh, they are hollow and they, uh, They're hollow. They're hollowed out. Um, they are... Uh, How do you do that? They're drilled, well, the way I do it, um, it's a set, solid piece of wood, and I drill and carve out the hollow all the way up to the, the top of the necks here. This is all hollow in here. And there's a separate piece glued on the top, so it's like a soundboard. Mm -hmm. I use a router and um, uh, carving chisels and gouges mm -hmm. to... to to get those, uh, to get them all smoothed out inside. And all of these have the uh, the signature Ron Cook carvings. Yes. Yep. Yep. I, I, all the pegs are. I have carved heads on the pegs. Um, the tail pieces are carved. Oh no. <laughs> and the bridge looks like a real bridge. Uh huh. Well, these instruments. This is a uh, a medieval fiddle. And this is uh, an instrument that uh, was from around the 1200s to 1400s. And uh, this is one of the instruments, this and this English crowd, which is a very early style of bowed instrument. And you can see the, the very similarity of this instrument to this one, you know, the, the uh, Saxon road. It uh, basically evolved from that with a fingerboard and a flat bridge to, uh, to bow across to get uh, just for a background sound, uh, background music. But between that instrument and this one, these are both instruments that I based on a wall painting at uh, Westminster Abbey Chapter House in London. And I just happened to visit there several years ago. And when I took pictures of the wall painting, there were a lot of figures in there playing instruments of that period, uh, it's the 1400s. And um, I thought, as we were flying, coming home, that uh, I told my wife I was going to make every one of those instruments. And I've uh, succeeded in making all but one, which I'll be showing you in a little bit, uh, that's in process now. Most of them were stringed instruments, and one of them was a pipe organ, and that's what I'm going to be working on next. But these are all... Uh, Influence from that wall painting. So what do we have here? <laughs> this is one of the medieval pieces that I'm working